Yo, futures! So this is going to be a more questions than answers uh, episode. <laughs> um, so I've been thinking about like how do we transition people away from the current conditioning, the current cultural operating system to something new. I think life in 2016, just like any other previous time era in history or any other time era in the future, we're kind of like trapped in these little cultural bubbles where we just kind of take things for granted and don't even recognize certain things. So I guess like the videos of the past few days have really been um, trying to like identify the you know the unknown unknowns, the those little cultural things that we just all take for granted and accept as like that's it. So I've always thought that nine to five jobs are basically like a form of slavery, um, and that's that's one of those cultural conditionings that the majority of the rest of the population think is fine. Like they think jobs are salvation. But then looking at other issues, like you know why why is property owned by anyone? Why is that the case? Why can't property be owned by itself and for the good of the social commons? And why can't cars own themselves and again like just operate themselves and provide a value to society where there's no one individual or government or group in control of that asset? Why is education always run by top-down institutions either online or offline like the traditional university and even the, like, the online MOOCs they're all run in a very hierarchical format still. And why is education always seen as like something that you you do you train and then you work and then you train and then you work they're separate um, and why are they separate? And they're like, what is money and how is it created and what good effects does it have? What bad effects does it have? Um, how is it like manipulating and changing the culture? Are people more individualistic and don't want to help each other? Why does rent cost so much? Why isn't rent as, as cheap as a Netflix or a Spotify subscription? Why isn't it like 10 bucks a month? Why do people accept that rent is expensive and just go along with it? Why do houses have kitchens? <laughs> it was stuff like this, like just like the most foundational like stuff that everyone takes for granted that in your daily life, you don't even question that stuff. Even like, why is this the time right now? Why have we all decided that this is like, we understand that time is a thing that moves forward, but why is this the specific time that everyone's accepted and we all adhere to? Why do people buy what they buy? Why do they buy a certain brands? Why do they buy expensive products over cheap products? Um, you know, what's influencing those decisions? Why are they doing it? Is it social? Is it economic? What is it? Why are they businesses? Why are they governments? Like so many questions. And then like, the thing is, what questions have I not asked yet? What questions have other people not asked yet? What things do we take for granted every day and don't even recognize? And what I tend to notice too is that like, you know, your cultural conditioning, your cultural operating system, the way you kind of live your life today has a huge effect on what you think the future will be and your ideas for the future. People think that the idea of cars owning themselves and the idea of property owning themselves is completely and utterly bizarre because it's so outside our what we're used to. You know, property is owned by people, cars are owned by people. And I think the majority of the population too could not comprehend a world or a society without businesses, without governments, without universities, um, <laughs> without all these things that we take for granted today. I noticed too that this uh, this whole concept kind of applies to sci-fi and talking about like you know colonizing other worlds and colonizing other star systems and kind of spreading out into the universe. I think we all assume that if like humans ever like uh, went to another star system, we'd go on this big, giant, massive starship like on you know Star Trek or Star Wars, and we'd go intergenerational. Or that advanced alien species would have these giant alien megastructures like Dyson spheres and you know Matryoshka brains and things like that. These massive things that you'd think we'd surely identify in the sky. And I think that's because we, as humans, we're at this certain level where we identify things we can see and touch and feel. Like when you see a skyscraper, you, you fundamentally understand the sheerness of that, that scale. And I think it's a direct byproduct of that. Um, we kind of have this uh, mental mindset of, you know, if the thing's bigger and more complex, then it must be more advanced and has progressed forward. Like, but our technology, even today, is like the, on the exact opposite trend. Like things that are more advanced tend to be smaller and miniaturized. I'm holding a phone that has advanced computational processes in it right now. The transistor and the CPU has basically given us everything we have today in our society, um, but they're operating literally at like the nanometer level, which we just can't even comprehend. My primitive monkey mind and your primitive monkey mind cannot absolutely under, like, cannot even imagine or comprehend the scale of a nanometer and the advanced processing in this CPU right now. And so uh, there's this awesome idea. I think I originally heard it from Hugo de Garris. He has some cool ideas, but some really crazy ideas, but this one's really cool. The idea that maybe all these advanced civilizations basically go inwards. And so as you advance as a civilization, as you go from an animal to a transcendent conscious like entity within that 25,000 year time gap, as, as Terence McKenna calls it, we don't advance outwards into the, the universe, we basically go inwards, we go down to the subatomic level, we digitize the entire human species, become non-biological and live at the femto level. And since you can actually perform Turing complete computations at the femto uh, and the ato level, like down within subatomic particles, it means it is actually physically possible to do in this universe. And from like all the mathematics in astronomy, like you know, a lot of Einstein's equations and people in the past, they basically predict certain phenomena in the universe because it works, the maths works out, therefore it is possible. 
And we've done this many times where the mathematics actually predicts certain phenomena within the universe. So things like uh, neutron stars, things like gravitational waves, which was only recently proved, you know, a couple months back. So anything that is physically possible within the laws of this universe is inevitable to happen or has already happened. Anywho, back to my point. So what I'm trying to do is basically build a brand new type of economy for people to, to live in, but I, I need to really work out a way to transition people across to it. A bunch of people have really good ideas on like new economic models, new structures for society, new ways in which we could live and operate as a species, but they have no real transition plan. You may have heard of like the Venus Project by Jacques Fresco, um, and he talks about a resource-based economy where there's no money involved. Cool idea, but they basically, their point is like, oh, let's just build a city and have no money. Like, what? But because it's trying to sell this brand new utopian ideal of like living in a society where no, no money is required or needed, I think it's so different to what people are used to that they kind of see it as this like unrealistic thing. And I know a lot of other online friends are kind of like designing new economic models like gifting economies and, and new kind of like cooperative governments and stuff like that. But again, like it's, it, it's too utopian in a sense. The end game vision is really important and it's important to kind of gather people who uh, buy into that vision, who uh, believe in it and want to help see it happen. But for the majority of the population, they don't care. Like the Venus Project's awesome and stuff. He's created all these like utopian ideals and architectural models and economic systems, but he hasn't provided the first step in order to, to transition to that model. I know it's a similar thing with, uh, so I run Sid Ethereum, which is like a Sydney-based uh, Ethereum meetup, and Ethereum's like this blockchain developer platform I always talk about, and people see the future of Ethereum in very different ways. So when I look at the Ethereum blockchain and that whole developer platform, what I see is uh, an opportunity for a completely blank slate. You know, no governments, no banks, no regulations, just start fresh. But the last few meetups have been run by one of our co-organizers who's a bit older, a bit more corporate uh, mindset. Um, he, he runs a business in financial um, blockchain-based developer consulting stuff. But what that means is the last few meetups have been so fucking corporate and all these like financial stooges in suits. Um, uh, but that makes sense. They're coming at it from the angle of like, oh, blockchain can help us you know, do things better. I mean, when you've worked in the financial industry and when you've worked for a bank or something for like the last 10, 20, 30 years, you see blockchain and you're like, oh, wow, we can actually make all this shit that we do in our financial thing more efficient. But so these fucking suits come in and they're always talking about regulations. Oh, how are we going to regulate this so it fits in with the blockchain? And like myself and Tristan and other guys who are more anarchist are like, you don't need regulations. The entire beauty of the blockchain is that it can, we can start afresh. There is no control, no government can access it. There is no regulations, there is no law. It's a wild west where anyone can do whatever they want. I'm ranting again, okay, bring it back again. Um, <laughs> so we need to transition people across. We need to understand the incentives that they currently have, um, which I think is basically like chase money, um, and we need to transition. Another great example here is the metaphors that we've used between every new technology stage. Um, so the reason you have folders and files on your computer is from the office era. Like in a traditional office environment, you have cabinets full of folders with files in them. And so what uh, Windows and Macintosh did is basically took that same metaphor, that same analogy, and applied it to the digital world. When the first combustion engine cars came out, I think like the Ford Model T, um, they were basically called, you know, uh, horseless carriages, because that's what people were used to. That's the way they transitioned that metaphor. Even the fact that this thing is called a smartphone, like it's more of a computer, it's more of a handheld device, a handheld computer, but we went from like obviously things that really look like phones to now a smartphone. So what I think all this means is that we're calling these little cultural conditioning bubbles. I mean, when the first, um, when people were like just used to using horse and cart and the, you know, combustion engine came out, you had to transition them across. If at the horse and cart stage, someone said, oh dude, here's, there's this awesome vision, like dude, we're gonna go to like, you know, all electric self-driving cars, it's gonna be amazing. People would be like, what the hell? With the horse drove itself, man, you can like tell the horse where you wanna go and it just drives you there and you can do whatever you want in the back seat and not even have to worry, not even have to look at the road. Whoa, it's so cool. So I think we're talking about a new economy or a new way of learning. Um, you still have to obviously have money uh, in that system because you have to guide people across. They have to understand that they can work in this system and earn money. And then it's also a lot about the wordings that you use, the language. I mean, we, the world is made of language, and so I think these analogies, these metaphors to different eras are kind of like wormholes. Like, say if you take the horse and cart concept and connect it to the horseless cart concept, the car, this is kind of like a linguistic wormhole where society can transition quite smoothly through. And so if we want to transition the entirety of human culture, society, and our operating system, and our structures, and the way we work and live, what are those wormholes? What are those analogies? How do we do it?